what I'm saying is possible. And I understand. And I got the belief and I got the trust. And that's what it, and I didn't need any other reason to go back in there and then re-ask my question, do, can do I do it? I made a decision to start the business. I made a decision to do it in scale. I have the equation correct. I have the problem rectified. Let's do it. And welcome back to the Money Mindset and Mentoring Podcast, where we bring you guests from all around the world. Today, I am super, super excited to bring in Nash here. He is the CEO of Hailtail. It's a company located in Canada, and, and it's a really interesting company. It's, it's really near and dear to my heart. It deals with real estate. And one of the things I think is so cool about it is it really is all about creating communities, uh, micro communities, and solving a problem for investors to ensure that they're maximizing the yield. You know, given the current times that we have, man, is it getting expensive out there? Uh, whether it's the purchasing price of what the cost of real estate is, or whether it's the cost of interest, as an investor in real estate, it can get really expensive. And, and it's always neat to look at the other options that are out there uh, of different ways to produce revenue for your real estate. So without further ado, Anesh, let's, uh, let's start the conversation and uh, introduce yourself. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, you actually gave a, did a great intro of my business. So that is it. And again, in short words, we're promoting the idea of co-living. Essentially, not one word is bringing community together into one house and how we can get that property get going right as it, from there and in terms of financial and in terms of the operations, how, that, how to make that happen. That's what we're doing as co-living and that's what Hailtail does. And that's amazing. And you know, that that as a birth birthplace for Hailtail, I think that's wonderful. And I think when you shared with me on our conversations earlier, you talked a little bit about, you know, what really moved you to kind of get this started. If you want to kind of share with our listeners a little bit about, you know, the motivation that happened at the beginning to kind of get this, uh, uh, this heading in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was always into helping people in terms of uh, accommodation side, although it was not my primary thing at first, but I got really into it because it uh, it gave me yeah, you started out like an engineer or something, didn't you? I, I was an engineer. I was an aerospace engineer, and I used to do this aside. But look what I'm doing right so now. So cool habitation in the skies. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, but look what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm doing this because you can see that. That's the juice that's giving me right now there, right? So, uh, yeah. So I started help, so help by helping a few people, which became a pretty serious game from there. And uh, I was looking to ideas where uh, how I can help a lot more people at the same time. And that's essentially what the idea of co living does. I've done hostels and uh, when I was traveling, went in Europe and Amsterdam, France, and I love to bring that concept uh, up here. And that's what I'm trying. And that's what I'm trying to implement in a uh, long term rental process or mid term rental process and how that can help our economy. What's what we're going through right now is essentially what we're doing. Well, you know, at this time, it's probably one of the most important things in real estate right now is, you know, if you look on both sides, you know, people say both sides of the fence. I think everybody's in the same uh, ecosystem. I think each relies on each other equally. So mm -hmm. in that ecosystem, you look at the landlords and the landlords are saying, hey, you know what? The cost of real estate is tremendously increased. The cost of interest rate is skyrocketed. You know, the, the baseline cost for plumbers, electricians, anybody to maintain and service the property has, has, has gone up, you know, uh, exorbitantly, you know, based on the cost of living. Then you flip over to the tenant side and the tenants are saying, look, like I, I make the same amount of money, but my grocery bills doubled. The cost of interest on my car that I just bought went up by crazy or my credit cards or whatever. And the cost on, on uh, rent has just quadrupled. You know, how do I, how do we all sustain? And, you know, thinking a little bit differently, I think, helps people solve problems. And, and I think it's solving problems really for both sides in the way that you're looking at presenting it. Like, let's face it, Friends came out in, you know, I don't know, was it was the 80s or something. I, I think it was. I remember watching it as a kid. Yes, so yes. I don't know if that's dating me or anything. But the, uh, you know, we all no, nobody thought anything different when we watched the show. Just a bunch of adults, roommates, you know, in an apartment in New York and and that was just a normal thing. And, and, and I think we should be seeing that normal now living a lot of outside of New York and outside of LA. We're seeing a lot of this cohabitation really starting to kick off because of the, the raw cost of living. Right. Absolutely. Like what, one of the things which like you mentioned about friends is that, you know, people used to love the show and they took all the good still part. Do. 
Still do. I, I still do. I still do. Like, no brainer. Go to friends and just sit there. It takes the stress out of your body, right? Yeah. But the thing is that you only look at the good, fun part of it, but you haven't taken learned the right lesson there. There's a good ecosystem, community, friendship that's gone on here. That is, that's the part which I was, I was looking at. And that's what I'm implementing here. How can we get different people? Essentially, they were different people. They were coming together and living in more than like a family. They were thick friends, right? Yeah. And this happens, this happened, I can tell you an example. This happened in one of the properties there here in Scarborough, for example. Like we brought in people from, it's a five bedroom property, and we brought people from different locations, like Indians and there was Persians, there's uh, guys from, a couple from uh, Europe. They came in, they started living there uh, for uh, seven months, okay? And that the property was only for seven months. And what happened is when they moved out, now they're renting a different property, all of them together as a family. They, they rented out different. So how cool is that to bring like six different people, put them together and they're not like a family. They know each well, other. Well, it's not even six different people. It's six different cultures. Absolutely. Like you were looking at, you. what did you say? It was a Persian. There was somebody from India. There's somebody from, uh, you know, the, the Europe or whatever, like, yes. et cetera. Like, that's amazing. And, and to have them have that sense of community and, and continue forward with that sense of community and friendship. That's an yeah. unbelievable situation. There's, there's a lot to learn from each other, right? The, the culture, the, 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 the food, like there's a lot to teach you there. They, have, they got things to talk. They got things to do together. They got things to gel together. So that's essentially the concept there. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and how have you found uh, landlords, uh, you know, taking this up as, a, as an option to your standard uh, single family uh, rental environment? What, what has their opinion been on it? What have sort of been the big successes and maybe some of the stumbling blocks? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a new new concept for most of the people, but people who get get to see the numbers, get to see the concept, get to see what they get out of the property compared to what they're doing right now, or compared to the fact that they have to sell the house because they cannot just stay in a, meet the both ends. Yet. They understand the concept, they understand, they like it. And when when they actually do it, the, the, the minimal efforts that they require to do in their property to get it out or rent it out or get it back to shape or flip the property at one point, they understand it. And those people are our biggest advocate right now. We yeah. don't have to tell them anything. They just go and tell their friends, do this. This makes your life much easier. There's less formalities and we're just getting done. People are in, people are out. They're happy. My house is pristine. So that's what's in there. And I mean, to other people, the individual homeowners who just look at like their house as a baby for them, oh, you have five to six different people. But when they understand the numbers, it's a game changer. But it's going to be a bigger game changer for someone like an investor who's talking money or someone who's working for an investor who's looking at money and improve their portfolio. All yep. they want is cash flow. And yep. for them, we're talking the game changer right now here. Well, what's interesting is when you look at this concept and you kind of hybrid it. I was thinking about this the other day as we uh, discussed this uh, idea of doing the podcast is for you've got that single uh, uh, person who is looking at buying real estate. You know, so they're looking at getting to their first house and mm -hmm. they want to do a little bit of house hacking. You know, right. for anybody who's not familiar with house hacking, what house hacking is, is you buy a part of real estate and then you rent out the rooms in which you live in. And uh, and and so therefore you can subsidize the space in which you live. My very first property that I bought, I, I I'd house hacked before the word house hack came out. And uh, so I used to travel a lot for work. I did sales training and sales consulting all around the world. I was in Japan. I was in England. You know, I was all over the United States uh, and it was an amazing experience, but I wasn't at home a lot, but I still wanted to buy real estate. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is as I bought a, bought a house and it had three bedrooms and I found three buddies to rent those three rooms. And then when I came home, I slept on the, I slept on the couch, <laughs> but I knew I was only home for four days out of the month. So I was able to, to make profit on that property that I bought. Uh, by by having those rooms rented out. And, you know, when it came time to uh, move on to the next property, you know, I was going from a position of strength, not from a position of being house poor. So it's not even just, I think, an idea of like, this isn't for the uh, the investor who's, you know, that uh, serial investor, who got multiple properties, but it's also for that newer investor who's, you know, saying, hey, look, I want to get into real estate. I can afford real estate on my own, but it's not about affording, it's about getting ahead. And how do I get ahead with real estate? Well, if you're if you're get just getting into to the workforce and you're looking at building up some asset value, house hacking is one of the best ways I believe 
to be able to start building a, a uh, an inventory of properties that you own and, and really start building your wealth. So I think uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to do that and create community. A lot of those people who, a couple of them I didn't actually know very well when they moved in and uh, they've been lifelong friends ever since. Yeah. And one of the things that, key thing that we're, we're not talking about here is the speed of things that we're doing here. We're not talking about going through major renovations or much work how speed your your house hit the market and get the returns that you're looking to get. That's exactly the word house hack. Getting there, right? We're not, we're not looking at lot renovations, but not uh, furnishing or staging. It's that you're getting it out there. People are coming in and then get going. The, the circle is on. Then end of the month, you get the paycheck or you get the money and then the cat. They're paying your mortgage. Yeah, and you bring up one of the things that I think is is really important. I mean, we talk a lot about strategies such as the Burr strategy or strategies such as short term rentals with Airbnbs. When we look at the Burr strategy, the Burr strategy there's there's a timeliness to it. And, you know, I own a bunch of properties converted into duplex now. Some of them we did during the uh, the lockdowns, and uh, and that was really really painful on the timelines to get things mm-hmm. done. You know, you might be carrying a property for six months, eight months to a year, or even beyond. You know, especially if, uh, you know, the city's moving at a snail's pace, you know, you're you're in a situation where it's going to take a long time to create that duplex. And that that property that has, you know, say three bedrooms up, two bedrooms downstairs, mm-hmm. when you have that duplex, it can be, you know, really long time to put that together. Yeah. And you have to carry that and then factor that into your return on investment. And where you're saying the speed uh, to, to market, you're saying is in this situation, you know, you can access, you know, with a, with a, a few little renovations to make the place look great attract the right type of tenants and uh, and set it up so that you've got a really good model for success because you're still seeing, you know, near or even better than duplex performance on that single family. Is that correct? Absolutely. That's exactly what we're talking here. Like, uh, obviously, yes, it depends on what kind of property you buy, but you have a decent property to put full rent. It's not like something you want to strip it down, but you have a decent property and you two options are you want to either do a large renovation to, to convert into duplex, triplex, like you said, yeah. Snail pace has gone on right now. Or you want to get speed and touch early. And then you, you can you can always get going. And then after that, you can still find ways to make revenue out of that after too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And when you look at things like the other option that people look at are things like Airbnb and, and other mm-hmm. short-term like, uh, what is it, Verbo, I think is the other other one that's out there. And I think there's a couple other platforms out there. But, you know, all these short-term, uh, short-term rentals are, are, you know, they have in the past really, you know, been hyper performers for people. You know, when you look at it from the rent compared to the rent of, say, a, you know, again, your single family, mm-hmm. you know, your money out of the gates heavier because, you know, it, you're, you're number one doing the rent, renos to make it flawless. Because if you want to keep your super host status, that place has got to be flawless. Everything's got to be immaculate. The second thing is, is you have to furnish it and supply it in an immaculate way as well. So, you know, when it's an immaculate, also stylistically on vogue. So you want something that, you know, if blue is in vogue, then that's the color you're going. If we're now going to taupe, which I have no idea what color taupe is, but let's say we're going to taupe, well, that's the on vogue. Now you've got to change your whole color platform. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you look at furnishing an Airbnb, sometimes those, that turnover can, you you might be 20, 30, $40,000 in, and then two to three years from now, you're doing a complete strip and redo, maybe at maybe 30,000, not not the 40 or 50,000 or whatever it is, but you're still that inventory that you have to put in is going to come at a cost. And I think what you showed me on a, on a spreadsheet was that when you look at the cohabitation versus the Airbnb, because of that outlay and the, and the, the, you know, the maintenance you have to do on the furnishings, it, it can actually almost outperform, if not does outperform Airbnb. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think a lot of people forget about, you mentioned the important part there, which is the trends keep changing and you want to keep on top of the market and, those are not something which people account for. But when you actually look at the comparative prices and the money that you make out of it, it absolutely outperforms an Airbnb. And right now, with what's going on with Airbnb, with uh, uh, the zoning bylaws and all the occupation occupancy rates that's gone on, people are looking for alternatives at this point because they cannot just go back to regular renting because that would be like comparing 100 to zero in terms of their difference in rent. And yeah. they are looking for the right opportunity there. And I think that's how it makes things a lot more work right now. Yeah, and I think you know when you look at the the zoning, I think that's one thing that you definitely hit on. I, I have a couple of clients of mine who, you know, they bought properties and they were cottage properties, and a lot of these communities, and I know you know a lot of the big cities have made a lot of zoning changes to prohibit short term rentals, because when you look at short term rentals, short term rentals are really they sit within a 
a different classification of zoning right. uh, than when they said when you look at residential. Residential is meant for long term occupancy, long term being anything over thirty days. Uh, whereas uh, your Airbnb is, you know, two to three nights. Well, number one, that sits with in certain areas with uh, tax applicable things, such as in Canada, you'll have HST that gets charged on short term rentals where you don't have HST on rent. And so they sit in different calibers and different uh, classes of, of the way that income has to be uh, declared and, and subsequently in the zoning as well. So I think those are some of the, the hurdles that people run into when they would look at Airbnb. But if you could overcome those hurdles and, and make a, you know, make a really good business out of it, I'm not saying Airbnb is not bad, but I, I think yeah. it's certainly not the magic pill for real estate. And I think, you know, just like when we look at uh, cohabitation, you know, you might have a situation where it could be great for profit, but there's also some pitfalls that can come with it too. And so what are some of the things that you, you've seen certain landlords, you know, seen as number one as pitfalls that they personally experienced? or that they think exists and really, you know, are something that can be overcome. Because I definitely think, you know, you know, I've had people say, oh, re rental properties, man, I'd never buy a rental property. Well, why would you never buy a rental property? Well, I'd never buy a rental property because I, I had a cousin who had a rental property once and that tenant uh, really destroyed the pace and, uh, and never paid their rent. Okay, so, so that's why you won't buy a rental property. Yeah, no, never, man, it's, it's so dangerous, like really. You know, have you ever heard of an employee that was a bad employee? And they're like, yeah, interesting. Well, would you ever want to own a business? Wow. Yeah, that'd be really cool someday. Well, in order to own a business, the difference between being self-employed is like I'm one person working by myself and being an entrepreneur, which means I own a business, is you have people that work for you. Well, tenants are just like people that work for you. If you treat them well and you choose them well and you, you handle their environment well, Generally speaking, they're going to do well back to you. Now, there's always going to be that one random story, one random case that's not going to work out well. But generally, if you do your due diligence up front and you look after them during their tenure, they're going to do a great, uh, uh, they're, going to, they're, they're going to do their part excellently as a tenant. Would you agree with that? That is a great point, Steve. Uh, I would say in, in terms of company, happy employees means happy company and successful company right there. It's the success inside. The happy and well-selected. Yes, absolutely. The yeah. same thing with tenants. Happy tenants means your house is being taken care of, tenants are taken care of. And essentially what, what happens is if the tenants uh, are not taken care of, they feel that way, that's when things start to go the other way around. And yeah. that's exactly why our, the software comes in. Because we, we spoke at the concept all this time, but we also have to talk about how we solve this problem, right? We are not just solving problems outside, but taking care of things that's inside the house how the environment there, how we have to get these guys to get together and start living. They just don't automatically just happen. We have to put those back together for them by using software. And that's when they connect the dots and make it happen that it becomes a community together. May that be managing the cleaning, may that be managing putting the garbage out. Simple things that these are things that they have to rotate, which brings a harmony in them and exactly what we do. And the, the, the cool thing here is, it's all managed virtually. You're not going there telling them all these things. It's all, you may not be any problem where you are. You can manage what's happening in, in your property in, in US, Canada, whatever, by doing it online. And you can see what's happening. And then the cool thing, another thing is that each person is actually watching out for each other. So you know it's not happening, it's happening. You again, everyone's going to watch out for there. So you're bringing automation within the, the house. And that's how the outside of finance, everything works out. That's the key secret there. That's amazing. And, you know, it's it's systems, I think, solve a lot of problems where people have uh, bumps in the road. They they kind of try to solve things through the the art of doing whatever they're doing rather than the science of having a system in place. And I think technology really, you know, if you find the right system, whether you do it on a piece of paper, whether you do it in an Excel spreadsheet, whether you do it in software, if you have the right system in place, all software does is speed that system up and produces better repeatable success. And I think, you know, that's where we start looking at the next gen of what you're looking at doing. This is what I'm really, really getting excited about, by the way, is this V2 that we've been talking about mm -hmm. um, is that on the V2, you know, you've got you've already got the, the ticketing for the uh, being able to do with the trades so that it will ticket out for the trades to say this needs to be done based on the uh, the tenant, you know, saying that maybe the, the, yeah. to the toilet's leaking or whatever. The other unique ticketing that you had was that, which I thought this was great, was the, the ticketing for cleaning. I mean, if you have a, a cohabitation space 
if you have a cleaner that goes in once a month and helps clean that place, like that's something that's going to keep that place in good check. Absolutely. And it shows that you care about the place, which means they should care about the place too. And I think that's something that's super, super exciting. Um, so being able to have that community and that marketplace on the, the vendor side of things that really needs to underpin, I think takes a lot of the guesswork out of being a landlord uh, and an investor in real estate, because that's always somebody's, you know, it, the first fear is obviously the tenants are going to ruin the place. The second fear is tenants aren't, aren't going to pay their rent. The third fear of, of, of buying investment property is something's going to break and I don't know how to fix it. And it's going to break in the middle of the night. I'm going to be sleeping. I, I'm going to wake up in the morning. My house is either going to be burnt down or it's going to be flooded or, you know, something's going to explode, whatever. And, and that ability to be able to have that ticketing and create that marketplace of vendors that can get that ticket, you know, right away and, and action on saying, yes, I'm ready to be teed up as soon as you click the accept button. I mean, that's amazing. Or you might have an auto accept or whatever you set up. I'm, you know, I'm just uh, speculating on some of these things, but you know, that's pretty exciting to have that as a, as a community there. But what, what sort of drove that as a, as an idea for you on that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I myself did a property management. I do have a property management company. And I, when I got to a point where I had a lot of properties uh, and uh, getting tickets in terms of maintenance at different sites, and it's essentially my problem. So I understood the problem myself, Chris. <laughs> so, and then I'm solving my problem. Then I've spoken around to people. It's, it's a million people's problem. And that's essentially where the idea came in. And then the first step, like I said, the V1 was absolutely to get a system to get the tickets done efficiently, like fast. You want to get there, you want to fix them, you want to let them know what's happening. Now, the second part is how to connect the site. And if, if, if as a homeowner or a landlord or anything, you, you will have all your parts checked out. Okay. I know what I'm doing. I have tenants. I have money. I have to think. Then there's nothing else fearing. And we want to give that confidence to people. To when it comes to a property and it doesn't have to be just about renting it's about managing a property you have to get get there and that's what we're that's inspiring us to and now we want to look at ai possibilities how we can if we can tell them that this is going to coming this is coming to you pretty soon you want to be prepared about it and you want to get that work done before even even happen then what else like you you're, you don't need to learn you're we're teaching you absolutely and I, and I think you know integration with monitoring systems you know one of the things it, it, you know, I, I kind of want to step back to where we met. We met at uh, Collision, uh, which is an amazing conference for tech startups. I, I think anybody who's in the tech business really needs to con consider being part of the Collision community. It, it does a really good job of networking with uh, uh, startups, with with investors, with business partners. And, and that's where we sort of first met. And, uh, and, and it was wonderful because, you know, I looked at a lot of the things that people were doing and I saw what you were doing. I was like, man, like, such a perfect time, such a perfect need. And then when you start looking at, you know, where technology is going and, and, you know, interfacing with some of those other products through an open API connection or whatever it might be to get the data sets. So for example, you know, I saw one of them had that, that water monitoring system so that you could, you could get an alert right away. So if something was leaking, it would tell you and immediately yep. connect to your system and then notify the plumber. Hey, wait a second. There's a water leak here. We got to get somebody out ASAP. You know, something like that, I think, is it just, you know, the more that we can make things, uh, you know, solve these problems, I think in the end, it becomes a lower cost of management, which gives a better either profitability to the landlord or better community access for people into, into, into real estate. Now, that doesn't have to be for cohabitation. That can be for single family. That can be for Airbnb. You know, that can be for any different type of, of rental uh, application. It could be for commercial. You know, right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different applications for this. You know, it's, it's just, and I think that's why when you look at some of the other elements of the, what you offer, where it's, you know, management of multifamily, you know, management of uh, cohabitation, you know, all the different elements of, of managing, you know, real estate investments right. and, and, and rental in whatever form it comes in. I think the platform, you know, you've got a wonderful platform to do that. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I, I think is that if, if you're an investor, homeowner, or no matter what, someone who's looking into investing it. And if you're able to find out the best performing property in the market and you're able to walk into that property and making an insightful decision of buying the property, making a, using a rent calculator, like what are you going to be outcome out of it what, with all the expense and compared to Airbnb, what makes better sense for me in that property there? And you, you're getting to a transaction very in front and there's nothing like it. And that's what I want to do. Like I want, I want people to be, have access to the best 
um, properties out there and get uh, the house hacking right away right there. But I think, yeah, and I think that, you know, each investor is going to have their own needs in the way that they're going to access the property. The house hacker is going to be looking for investing in one specific way, whereas the seasoned uh, investor who's, you know, got multiple properties is going to be looking at things a little bit differently and be able to normalize using whatever their conditions are to a specific number of a return on investment. Like everybody talks about cash flow, talks about your capital appreciation, all this stuff. I mean, let's just normalize it right back to how much money did I put out and what is my return over whatever period of time? This way you can normalize and say, my Airbnb gave me a return of this amount. My, you know, sixplex gave me a return of this amount. You know, my investment in bonds gave me this amount. My, my, my crypto or whatever else I'm going to be investing in gave me, you know, this return. So then you can look at all the different returns and say, based on those and my risk profile and the amount of capital that's required, the amount of credit that's required, you know, what am I able to do based on these different uh, scenarios and where, where will my return come back as? And I think, you know, those calculators that you're working on and producing those, uh, you know, those are going to be unbelievable uh, tools, you know, for, uh, for landlords and for investors to be able to use and for house hackers to be able to use to say, Hey, this, this is a house that I think I can get into because, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you worked on partnerships to bring in data sets, you know, from, from different, you know, data brokers for rents and, 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 uh, you know, that kind of a thing to, to pop it in. Yeah. In different areas so that people can look at it and see what, what are the, what are the, the data brokers saying? Like what, what are we seeing from that side? And I think being able to pull that in gives people, uh, you know, some upfront uh, basic information before they can make a uh, that decision. And I think that that is a really strong feature of the software for sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we're we're as a team, as a company, we're stoked about developing it, and it's a lot of help for a lot of people, especially from you and the people who are in the industry experts. And that's what we want because that's, that's what we're, we're building something which means people who are involved in industry. That's kind of what we're building. And yeah, uh, we're pretty excited about it. And we have, we do have up there and keep improving it. How, like, like I said, if I put my $5 into it, what's the best return that I can get from $5 out of that? That's essentially as simple as that. How we can give it in front of you. That's what we're working on. Well, you know, the, the best thing is, is, you know, listening to your customers, listening to the market that you want to get into. Rather than telling them what you're going to do is going to be, give you a faster out the door to give you a base of revenue. You know, your, your market's going to tell you what's important. You might think something's important and it's not. You know, you might, you might say, I'm going to try to tell the market what they're going to buy. Well, if you're big enough, you probably can do that. But when you're small, it's going to be very difficult to do that because, you know, what you have done is you haven't created something that is you know, completely revolutionary. It's not like you made the first wheel. It's not like you sent the first man to space, but man, are you solving needs in the market, especially in a timely position where, you know, Airbnb, you know, returns are going down, where interest rates are going up, where vacancies are at an all time low and, you know, incomes are, are struggling. And I mean, you've got such a perfect timing to create a solution to solve so many people's problems. So it's listening to them and saying, you know, Tell me what the problems you're having, and we're going to make these this, a massive success out of this. And I think your pivot on it, especially getting the calculators in there, I think that's huge because then people, before they get into the situation, they can make the decisions before they get there. I mean, I, my biggest thing for people is do some work up front before you make a decision. You know, I mean, when people are buying, I mean, if it's a small decision, like buying a candy bar, who cares? You know, but when you're going out and, and investing, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars and tying yourselves to, you know, potentially million dollars worth of mortgage debt, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to be in a situation you've got to make that decision intelligently because that's going to lock you up for a period of time because you can't exit. It's not like a stock. You're like, oh, I'm watching it go down. I'm out. You know, there's going to be cost to enter and a cost to exit. And that that generally means you have to be in that investment for a period of time. So you've got to make the right decision and having those numbers up front really helps you make the right decision. And especially if you do that early, like my belief is, is when people, especially the first time they're ever buying investment property, they need to be spending two to three to four months minimum in advance, acclimating to the market, acclimating to the, you know, what's out there, acclimating to the rhythm. And if they're doing that, especially armed with calculators, so they can focus on the most important thing, which is risk is one and numbers is two. 
You know, right. so if they can be comfortable with the risk of the investment, and then second of all, they can be comfortable with the numbers and the true return that they're going to be getting. I think those calculators prove themselves invaluable. And as a real estate agent, I think you would only be doing a disservice to your client if you did not provide them with a true calculator. The amount of real estate agents that I talk to that don't have calculators for investment properties, and they just rely on the, the client to be able to say, to do their own work. I think that's a disservice, in my opinion, as a real estate agent. I think, you know, giving them guidance to say, hey, look, you know, here's a calculator that I've used or here's a calculator that, you know, a lot of people have been using, such as the one that you're creating. And, uh, you know, I think that that is that is, you know, uh, doing a good service for your client, you know, solving a, uh, a challenge that they, they definitely need to be answering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looking at it. You yourself telling because you're a realtor and, and profession mm -hmm. too. So you yourself telling it's my customer telling me, right, this makes sense to my customers. So that itself right there is an approval in one way. And essentially that's what we're looking to hear from the people that we're working yep. with. Uh, yeah, as a you know, as a guy who owns multiple properties, as a guy who's been in real estate for over 10 years as a real estate agent, as a guy who owns a mortgage broker with multiple agents, you know, uh, you know, distributed across the province, you know, it's it's something that we see all the time. You know, we see people getting into investment properties and not running the numbers up front. And the first thing we say is, why are you not running numbers? You've got to be doing that. And, and so that's why I see it as a, as a, as a need is because I want people to be educated because I, I, I don't want people to be afraid of investing in real estate. I think real estate, you know, when you invest in real estate, you provide access to people who could not live in that asset class if you didn't buy it and rent to them. You know, right. most of the, you know, most of the people out there, if you did not buy single family, well, they wouldn't be able to rent sing single family. You know, people look at it, landlords and they think landlords are scooping up all the properties so nobody can buy them. Well, they're scooping up all the properties. So that person who couldn't buy that property now is able to rent that property. So they're actually providing access to uh, properties that were once never available. You know, people, if they rented, they rented apartment buildings. You know, they rented in, in spots that weren't uh, that single family in that neighborhood or weren't that, uh, uh, that, that semi or whatever in that nice neighborhood. So I think it, it provides a really good access. I had a friend of mine just a couple of days ago, uh, you know, he's, he's moving from one property to the neighborhood. And, and if somebody wasn't renting the house down the street, he would have had to move his schools out of the, his kids out of the school district. But because, you know, other properties are available of these single family homes, you know, he's able to to move into something that uh, keeps his kids in the same, same school district. So yeah. I yeah. think that's I think that's that's paramount to keep on providing these uh, availabilities to people to be able to. Landlords are not the bad people. You know, landlords are good people. You know, for the most part, they're, they're looking at, hey, I've, I've got a, a bunch of money and and I want to put it back into to the community and invest in my community and, you know, put build housing for people. You know, are there some of them slumlords? Of course there are. Are some of them that are absolutely amazing people? Of course, there are. And there are a lot of people in the middle. Absolutely. Just like anything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Landlords are an important part of the equation. And this equation is not complete with that part because they, they are the one who's making it happen. And that's why people are able to rent. May that be in any location, any posh location, anywhere. That's the key location that's ha happening. Right. So that's right. I agree, personally agree to that. Yes. If, if every landlord sold all their properties to homeowners, that means any there'd be no homes left for people to rent. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, so I can, I can just buy. If I have a bunch of money, I just have all the property, thinking it's going to appreciate and and not rent it to anyone. What's going to happen? No one's going to be able to. Everyone's going to go have to. That's right. Apartment buildings or whatever. Yeah, I, I think when people buy houses and they speculate and they create a huge amount of vacancy in a neighborhood. I've a friend of mine lived in uh, uh, Vancouver and he moved into a condo where most of it was bought by foreign money, and ninety percent of the building was vacant. And so in those situations, I think that's where I think there's there's some issues, personally speaking, because, you know, that sense of community of that condo, that neighborhood, you know, those small businesses that open up downstairs thinking that the dry cleaning was going to have some people come and buy the pub or the the, the coffee shop. We're going to have, you know, all these people and there's nobody because it's just a, a, a barren wasteland that I could see as a big issue. You know, landlords who buy it with the exact purposes of, of having somebody occupy the property, I think that's a beautiful and it should be a well-supported area of the of the Canadian market by the governments, by the municipalities, by the bylaws to ensure that, that people have that occupancy. And the same thing applies when you look at cohabitation is that bylaws, municipalities, you know, where people are looking at saying they need to provide affordable housing. Well, right there, that word alone provides affordable housing. 
because it takes that cost and divides it up by a number of people so that their incomes become greater than what the the rents are and they can be able to support the cost that's been burdened on the landlord. Exactly. Exactly. And this is exactly what we're we're actually having a chat with the city of Toronto right now in terms of they're looking ways to say we need to increase the product new mayor and she's all in for it. And and we're having a solution right in front of you. Just need we just need to be on the same side and get this adopted. And people are finding value out of it. That's just what we're trying to do. And we're gonna get get there. Oh yeah. No, I, I think it's something that again, friends came out a long time ago. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's something that will definitely resonate in, in a lot of the, the municipalities for sure as we move forward. Um, when we look at some of the other thing that I think is exciting, you know, when we look at finding properties, you're building that AI to be able to look out into the market and look for properties based on people's um, specific needs. I think that's really cool. I think creating the, the sense of community with the the chosen, you know, mortgage broker, the chosen, chosen real estate agent or financial planner, you know, with your white labeling of the product. I think that's pretty interesting because I think, you know, it allows that person who helps them find that property, who's helping them to ensure that they're hitting the returns, being able to see the fruits of their labor and being able to work with them to consistently help them build their, their portfolio and support their portfolio. I think that's amazing. And, and for the real estate agent, let's face it, it helps them with their branding. Right. I mean, a, a real estate agent who can have all of their investors in one spot managing all their properties, looking at that magic ROI number front and center on the on the on the dashboard to see this is what those uh, properties are producing. I think that right there alone is is one wonderful way to cement a long term relationship, because if everybody's making money, man, that's a beautiful situation. I agree with that. Now, when we look at uh, running the business of Hailtail, let's talk a little bit about you know, some of the things that, you know, when you first, there was day one, when you first said, you know what, I'm going to make this a business and, uh, and, and talk about some of the, the business elements of what it took to, to get into the startup world to say, uh, I am now going to start this full time. I'm leaving my other job and now making this my endeavor. Talk a little bit about, you know, the mindset that it took to get there and, uh, and what was going through your head when your friends probably thought you were crazy. Oh yeah, uh, a lot of people. A lot of people like saying no to that paycheck was <laughs> it was it was uh, crazy for a lot of people. But I I I, I kind of look at the bigger picture there, like, and I kind of wanted to make myself believe that I'm able to do it. So what I did is I became the other side here. I did it in person, no software, nothing. I did it in person to see what what I'm saying is possible, and I understood, and I got the belief, and I got the trust, and that's what it, and. I didn't need any other reason to go back in there and then to re-ask my question, to, can do I do I made a decision to start the business. I made a decision to do it in scale. I have the equation correct. I have the problem rectified. Let's do it. And uh, true, and it, I'm, I'm a new entrepreneur in terms of startup world. So that's why I think the accelerators, is, it's a game changer for me too. It, it gives a different change in mentality of how you think, how you want to grow, how you want to scale. That helped. So Angler was the first one that I was there. They were working with a bunch of VCs there. They invested a little bit in, in, at the beginning. And that gave a great inspiration and coaching from them. And then how you want to look at the business. Because it's, it's when you look at a little different, it's a bit different from how brick and mortar. But at the end of the day, it's all revenue. But at the same time, you, you want to look at the bigger picture. You want to always continue to grow. And or at the same time, you want to also make revenue. These are three things you keep in mind and keep growing. And that's kind of what me and my partner triggered on and decided, okay, we're going to go full end and rock this out. Now, when we look at revenue, that's one of those things that I know a lot of startups, you know, that's, that's, it, it's funny because I've spent a lot of time in the startup space and it's always seems like it's the dirty word. You know, people don't want to talk about revenue. They always want to talk about, you know, their, their, you know, which round of financing are they getting? They want to talk about their angel funding. They want to talk about those two beautiful letters of the V and the C and uh, and talk about all the debt or all the equity they can give away. But a lot of times they never really hone in on revenue. And I think, you know, I think revenue is one of those things that it's either going to get you at the beginning or it's going to get you at the end. You know, I've seen a lot of these startups, they come, they raise, you know, an enormous amount of capital. And then they ended up, you know, absolutely imploding because they don't have any revenue. And, you know, one of the things that we had talked about when we first, you know, started in, in working together on some of the things that we're doing was really honing in on, on the idea of number one, getting our mindset right around revenue and revenue and the importance of, you know, that's one of the most important things when running a business because it's the lifeblood of your business. You know, a lot of people when they're looking at, man, I'd love to add that extra feature, but I don't have the money. You know, I'd like to hire that extra person. 
but I don't have the money. Man, I really want to go to that. Oh, I don't have the money. You know, and, and you're either going to you're either going to solve that I don't have the money with debt, or you're going to solve that I don't have the money with revenue. And the idea of being able to think big and be able to 10x your goals, you've got to be able to start focusing on 10xing your revenue. And talk to me about that mindsets, you know, uh, pivot that happened, you know, as we sort of started uh, our discussions and sort of what went through your brain as we went through that dialogue. It's true. It happens with all the founders. I would, and I don't blame anyone too. And it happened to me as well. Like as you go build a company and you kind of forget, you want to keep focusing on how much you want to do. And then you forget uh, the fact that, oh, you know what? I, I'm, am I forgetting to make money here? Am I forgetting about the revenue here? I'm building everything here, but I'm, I'm forgetting the key thing that's not need to come out of all things. Uh, and uh, like having the chat with you, like having that small chat with you, like keeps me asking those questions back here. Like, what am I building towards to? Like, if I'm making that money for them, and I need to be see that happens in myself, and uh, we need to set a goal and work towards that goal. Let 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 revenue not be product, but revenue be the goal that you want to set for yourself and work towards that and make that problem solve with that perspective. That makes a game changer. Then everything that you do will actually make sense, and then you're going to push, and everything you think and dream is always going to be that revenue. And I think that's what it's just gone through what my mind right now. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, uh, and I, I spoke to my other uh, founder friends. This, this went through the, they went through the same thing. And some of them have failed. Some of them have had to quit because they went too far, pushed it too hard. And then end of the day, uh, all the VC funds, everything's stopped because there's no revenue. Because yeah. end of the day, you know, you go through a, a, a pre-seed funding, seed funding, but when you go to the next level, that we, uh, revenue is not there. They're going to stop the, turn the tap off. And then, then we're going to be looking around. Okay, now we have no revenue, no cash. What are we going to do with everything? So that's exactly the, 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 the important point that I think we're talking about here. That's exactly right. You know, it's, it's the same thing with marketing. You know, a lot of people talk about marketing and, you know, the idea of building a website, building all these landing pages, building all these, you know, ev events and that sort of thing for marketing. But, uh, you know, I, the, 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 the term is, and I think it was Pete Vargas or Grant Cardone, one of the two, you know, said this term. They said, like, a road without traffic is useless. Mm -hmm. You know, and a business without customers is useless. You know, now, now sometimes, yeah, companies like Google and that sort of thing, they'll run on those heavy burn rates because they've got that big sort of picture, you know, data set that they're running with where, you know, it, they're, it's a different model for success at the beginning. You know, but most of the companies that I see in the, in the founder space, you know, at there were at Collision, they've got a product that they need to get out and they need to sell and, you know, and they need to promote. And, and, and the first thing is, is number one is getting the promotion going. The second thing is then converting that promotion into actual real clients. And then the third thing is making those clients such raving fans that they can't help but tell their friends that they can't help but buy more stuff from you. And I think that's that's the a really good model for success for businesses that are really looking at getting off the foot, you know, getting off the, the that first start. Because if they don't have that revenue, it's going to be so much harder to make those decisions because they're having to ask somebody else to make a decision. When you have the money, you make the decision. When you're going to your VC and saying, "Hey, I, you know, I really want to do this. I need more capital." That's a lot harder to make that decision, and your speed, you know, completely comes to a burning halt. Because you don't have the capital. Whereas if the money is in the bank, you're, you're looking at going, you know, game on the foot to the, you know, pedal to the floor and let's just grow this thing. And speed is everything. I think when you're looking at startups, uh, because, you know, you just started up, which means somebody in the world probably has, has done the same thing as well. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, what is the most exciting thing for you moving forward? Uh, you know, as we start to close off. You know, what are some of the most exciting things for you moving forward, you know, heading to, to close off 2023 and looking into 2024? What, what's the thing that excites you the most? Uh, we've went through a bit of those points right now, like uh, the, 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 the calculator that we're coming in, the new versions of it, and then how we're going to use existing technologies to use that version. And uh, the new spectrum or the new revenue size version that opens up this up to us which we haven't uh, have been using as much so far is really excited. Like we we figured out the problem and solution part, but how to scale that part or how to bring the revenue out of that part was what we're there. And then it has, that is in front of us right now. And it's just really exciting. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where this is going to take us and what, what all we're going to learn out of this and how how better we can you know make it better. And then, like I said, how 
you uh, as a customer, you as my our mentor and friend, or any new person that I'm going to talk to is going to talk to 20 other people about what we do right now. You, you guys are not doing this. You're missing it out. I want them to say that. And to make them say that is what's going to be my day and night for well, the thing is, anytime says something, somebody's saying negative about you or somebody's saying you need to fix this, what it means is they're talking about you. And that yeah. means you have their attention. And then if you're able to get their attention and turn their negative into a positive, you've got a customer for life. And because it means that you listen to them and the amount of people who are out there in the world that don't have anybody listening to them and uh, that they just feel like they're just a little blip in the in, in, in space. Mm-hmm. And if you actually say, you know what, what you told me is extremely important. And in fact, it's so important that we're going to make dramatic shifts in what we're doing here to make sure that we solve your problem. That's the way that you can absolutely, you know, completely dazzle your clients. So I think that's that's fantastic that you have you have an open open mind. Uh, in, a, in a willingness to grow uh, with your client's needs. I think that's fantastic. Uh, the last question I really want to end off with is when you were watching Friends, uh, mm-hmm. who was your favorite character? 100% Joey. Ah! <laughs> He's the bond there. He's, that's the, it's because we're, we're we're bringing the communities and he's the person who's keeping them, bring the smile in people's face and that smile is getting them running. So 100% Joey. Nice. Yes. I mean, Chandler is, is a, it's a good part, but Joey is the fact that I excite Chandler. So Joey is, and what about yours? Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to have to go with, uh, with the Joey as well. Joey being one of, uh, you know, one of my favorite on that show, you know, bar yeah. none. Yeah. You know, his, his sense of comedy, his, his sort of, uh, you know, just, just, happiness and joy in life was just uh, something that I can completely identify with. No matter what, what stress of a day you are in, you sit in front of that, you, oh, wait, it still make you laugh. You're probably running it for the 20th time, but still make you laugh. That's, that's right. The best thing, that's the magic about that show. And that, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. That. Well, I, I am super excited to see the impact of, of, you know, what we're doing together, you know, make your business an, an absolute success. I'm super excited to see the, uh, the new developments in what you're doing, you know, watching what you're doing with, with new to Canada, you know, new to the U S you know, people who are moving new to the country. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to provide because I know, you know, the country needs immigration and especially immigration of people who are coming in, wanting to work. People are coming in, wanting to integrate and to create that uh, environment where people can do both and, and live in a place that's safe. I think that's amazing. And then, you know, rewarding the people who've been, you know, here and investing in the country and, and putting out those rental properties and making those spaces profitable and well looked after. I think that is a, a wonderful thing. So kudos to you and your team and uh, really looking to see, uh, you know, you guys develop that next chapter. Thanks, Steve. I'm, I'm excited to, that we're going to be doing a bunch of things together as well. So I'm really excited for that. And uh, I can I, I just want to absorb the energy from you and then put it in my screen here. That's what I'm looking to do. And that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> energy is my name, man. Energy is my name. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, my friend. Well, you enjoy your day. And uh, thanks so much for joining the show. And, and ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. We really appreciate everybody, you know, checking in on here. And don't forget to uh, like and subscribe on the po- on the platform that you are listening to. And uh, we really appreciate it. And reach out, put some comments on the show. And thanks so much.